All right, they should never let me near the technology. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Haley Goldman. I'm the executive director of New Hampshire Humanities. And thank you all for being here tonight. This is really an awesome group. Thank you all for being here. This is great. So here, uh, we need, there's some space over here. Yeah. So I'm going to keep uh, my comments short. Mostly, uh, the, the big comment is, we're really excited that you're at a program like this with us. We've been waiting to be back in person in Concord for a long time. Uh, this is the end of our spring series of Ideas Tap. We're hoping that you will come to more, and we're hoping to do more in the fall. Unfortunately, we can't announce dates or times or topics, although we're working with Meg on that. Um, but if you want to sign up for our e-newsletter or things like that, you'll hear about these programs as they come up, and we encourage you to come back for more. Um, the public service announcement I have for the evening is that someone might have lost a pair of glasses. If you've lost them, please let us know. Slightly anticlimactic after reminding you to come. This is such an exciting program, right? The, the idea that we can talk in a week like this week about constitutional law and talk about the informed citizen. So I'm not going to dwell on it, but think about these kind of details, take these topics home with you, have more conversations, talk about these things with your family, your friends, your enemies, your, your, you know, anybody that you, you know. Um, but this is really that chance to really dig into a topic, which is something we don't get it often enough. So enjoy that. Come with your questions. We do hope we'll have a strong, complicated panel and that you'll have respectful but tough questions for them afterwards. I get to introduce Meg Mott. Meg's title is the best ever. She is a constitutional wrangler. She spent a lot of time in the academy teaching people things, but the most important part is that she now helps people like us think about the Constitution, how it works in our lives, and think about those uh, conversations difficult. So I'll let Meg introduce the group. I give you Meg Mott. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, New Hampshire Humanities. Thank you, Catherine Winter, for doing all the panel gathering. Uh, I'm very excited to be here this evening with you all and with this illustrious panel. Um, uh, before I introduce them, just to give you a sense of what it means to be a Constitution Wrangler, you don't need a JD. However, if you know somebody with a JD, and I know we have at least two people here with a JD, just two, uh, it's always useful to go and ask them some questions. But the key piece is that citizens, being a part of the people, are the authors of this Constitution. We the people. So I know it, it can feel like, oh my goodness, are really we the people in charge? Particularly if uh, it's been a, a week with the Supreme Court and you feel as if, no, it's not the people's constitution, it's the illustrious justices who are telling us what's right and what's wrong. But in fact, it is our constitution. And the better we understand it, uh, the better our democracy works. And here's the best thing about a constitution. We don't agree what it means. Because people are disagreeable and disagreeing. But the idea is that by sharing ideas, hearing different points of view, understanding the principles that guide this constitution, that will make better decisions for ourselves and for our locality. I'm very excited about the New Hampshire Humanities Ideas on Tap because it gets us into ordinary places where people are drinking beer or eating pickles and uh, just having a normal kind of day and then at the same time thinking deeply about a constitutional issue. So uh, let me tell you who we're going to be talking about, uh, who we're going to be talking with. Um, about one specific Supreme Court. It's not a decision. It's just the first pass almost in a case that has to do with social media. So the focal point, and you can find on your table uh, a pamphlet that will give you some of the text that might be helpful in this discussion. Um, 
and I'll go over those details in just a minute about what this case is all about. You probably read about it perhaps in the, in the local paper or in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. Um, so we'll go over those details. But first let me tell you who is with us here. And um, I'm going to use my cheat sheet because when I get excited, thinking about wrangling the Constitution. And, and, and just one other little side note, uh, Allison, my partner and I, we live on a goat farm. Uh, if you're a vegetarian, cover your ears. But uh, two days ago, we had goat roast, which involves digging a pit, putting bricks in the ground. Uh, there was two kids that are no longer neighing with us, but then became on the spit in the pit. And the only way you can do it well is you put a roof on it, and then you take mud. So there's already been some mud wrestling to start this. And you take the mud and you put it all around the roof so that the smoke does not come out and three hours later you have beautiful, beautiful meat. So wrestling, mud, constitutional thinking, letting things kind of stew underground for a while, that's, that's the image I have, like what, what we're gonna do. Those of us without a JD. Uh, the people with a JD, they stay clean. There's no mud wrestling. Uh, but let me tell you who these fine people are. Uh, to my left is Justin Silverman. And you can see on this other uh, program that we, we were very excited. We wanted to start this panel with Justin Silverman as our anchor. He is the executive director of the New England First Amendment Coalition, uh, an important organization that's keeping the First Amendment and all its um, what do I want to say, disagreeable aspects and agreeable aspects, it's illuminating aspects, it's troubling aspects alive throughout New England. So really happy to have Justin. And to Justin's left is Nick, who you may know from NHPR Civics 101, Nick Capodice. Did I say that correctly? Okay, great. Uh, and if you haven't heard NHPR Civic 101, it's worth taking a look at, listen to. It will give you a lot of information about Supreme Court cases, how decisions are made, how legislatures work, how federalism works. It's a very complicated system we have. Uh, and this is an important resource that we have helping not just high school students, not just teachers, but all of us to understand this uh, form of government we have. To Nick's left is Anna Brown, who you may also hear on the radio. I feel like I've heard you on the radio, Director of Research and Analysis at Citizens Count. Citizens Count, there's a lot of different ways to make sense of that. Good wordplay. Um, and Anna has a, is co-hosts the podcast $100 Plus Mileage. Anybody know why it has that title? Yes. Are you paid that terrible pittance? Yes, I was paid that three times. You were paid that three times. Thank you, Bill, for, for we, we uh, feel you. Um, and finally, we have John Graby, the Warren, who is, directs the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service. He's also a UNH Franklin Pierce law professor, teaches constitutional law, and um, I gather is one of New Hampshire's great law teachers. So very excited to have you here, John, as well. Uh, okay, so maybe before we get into the details of the case, I'm going to ask each one of our panelists just to give us a sense, starting with Justin and then going, why did you want to do this tonight? Well, first off, thanks for being here tonight and taking some time out of your evening to have this conversation. You may have to raise this. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Way yeah. back there? Yes? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so Meg asked me to talk a little bit about just the importance of the First Amendment, why it's important to me. And I think to explain that, I'm going to borrow some words from another professor. This guy's name is Bert Newborn. I believe he still teaches at uh, NYU. But in any case, he wrote this great book called Madison's Music. And the whole premise of the book is that the First Amendment, the five freedoms of the First Amendment, were written in a way, in a very specific order, to provide all of us a blueprint for our democracy. And I'll get to that in just a moment, but real quick, can we collectively come up with the, the five freedoms? Can everybody shout them out? Speech, religion, press, assembly, petition. Good. You know, uh, there's a, uh, 
an organization called the Freedom Forum out in DC. They do a survey every couple of years. Over a third of Americans every year can't name a single freedom in our First Amendment. 98%, if not 99%, can't name all five. And all five, according to this professor that I mentioned, work together to provide this blueprint for democracy. And the argument goes, before we can do anything, as a society, we have to first figure out what's important to us. What are our morals? What's important to us as individuals? And that's where religion, the right to be religious or not religious, comes into play. We need that freedom first. We need to figure out where our moral compass is at. And then once we figure that out, we need the ability to speak freely about what's important to us. It's not just sufficient enough to know what's important to us. We have to actually speak these things and share what's on our mind with others. But it's not good enough to just do that one-on-one -on -one or just in a, a room like this. We need to do that to the masses. We need to speak freely to the masses and make sure as many people as possible hear what we have to say. And that's where the press comes in. So we're using religion, speech, press to convey all of these thoughts as widely as possible. But as far as our democracy is concerned, we need to go further than that, right? Because we not only need to share ideas, but we need to assemble as a people. We need to gather around those that have similar ideas as us. We need to uh, picket in the streets. We need to protest in the common. We need to be able to assemble around these ideas. So that brings us to four. And now that fifth petition that most people forget is part of the First Amendment is perhaps the most important because no matter how much picketing we do, no matter how we assemble or speak our mind freely, we need the right to ask government to change, to act on our behalf. And that's where petition comes in. So religion, speech, press, assembly, petition are five freedoms of the First Amendment. And I really like that because even though our democracy is not perfect, even though we have a lot of work to do, I think it really does when you look at those five freedoms in the order that they appear in the First Amendment, give us an ideal democracy. It gives us something to work for, to fight for. And for me, I think that really helps put the First Amendment in perspective. Thank you, Justin. So, Nick, can you follow that? What it, I mean, what I should just pack up and... No, no, no. Uh, Civics 101, you yeah. can do this. That was the goat story. Where am I going to go after that? Uh, if there's if, if any of you out there, and so I'm Civics 101. I am the opposite of Justin. I mean, we're, 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 we're two halves of the same coin. Uh, if any of you have trouble remembering the five freedoms, just hold up one finger. Hold up, someone hold up a finger right now. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so the five freedoms, you can say, uh, religion, point to the heavens above. Take that finger and press it against your hand. Press. Oh. Speech. Just one finger does it all. Petition, pretend to, pretend to sign a little, and then finally, assembly. Come here. Join my assembly. Nick, Nick, can you explain petition? Like, I've never oh. petitioned this way. Oh, well, signing a petition saying, you know, oh. a Supreme Court justice should be impeached or something, hypothetically, right? Um, so I, I, I'll, be, I'll be quick. I, I, um, I, have, I don't work for an organization that champions the First Amendment, but it's dear to my heart. I've, I've produced half of the episodes of Civics 101 for the last four years on NHPR. I care deeply about the Second Amendment. And my argument, which isn't necessarily a true one, is that this First Amendment didn't matter at all. Um, the most shocking thing I learned when I started working for the show is that uh, the whole Bill of Rights, in fact, was dubbed a tub to a whale, which is one of my favorite expressions. If you're on a whaling ship and the Leviathan is crashing his tail about, you throw a wooden wash tub to the side and the Leviathan turns and crushes the wash tub instead of your whaling boat. The, 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 the story being, as Woody Holton told me, nobody cared about the Bill of Rights when it came out. They just cared that there was one. Nobody was really nervous about gun ownership, and in fact, the Second Amendment didn't have anything to do with gun ownership until the 1970s, and I'll talk about that after the show if you want. Um, nobody was terribly concerned about freedoms of speech, uh, or uh, you know, what, which that, the Seventh Amendment. If it's a $20 or more case in front of a civil court, there should be a jury. Who's fighting for the Seventh Amendment these days? Uh, so my point is, is that at the time, the First Amendment, which was initially the Third Amendment, the first two amendments that were, uh, of the 12 proposed by Madison did not get accepted by the, ratified by the Congress. So speech and all the other four, that was our third amendment. Um, anyways, it became important. It became really dang important to me, to you, I dare say to many of you here in this room. Things that start out some way because of the way the framers intended become something else. 
Today we're going to talk a little bit about interpretation. We're talking about the freedom of speech. But what I beg you all to do, if you're looking at what did the framers mean when they started it, to not just hold it in reverence. It wasn't until 1920 that there was a Supreme Court case about the freedom of speech. Think about what did we do from 1790 to, 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 to 1920? There was no law that the Supreme Court found unconstitutional because it restricted your freedom of speech? No, there wasn't. These things became important because people put their bodies on the line in the civil rights movement and uh, protesting the war, starting with the Great War and going up to now. They became important and that's why we should revere them. And I went on a little bit long, but that's uh, why I'm here tonight. That's Thank beautiful. You. Thank you very much, Nick. Anna, what do you have to say? Like, why did you want to be on this panel? So I'm coming from this a slightly different angle. Citizens Count is focused on New Hampshire government and our democracy here at home and explaining that, getting, making it easier for people to get involved. But so for me, I was interested in looking at all these things that are happening on the federal level and social media. And we think about this as something that's kind of far away from us. You know, Mark Zuckerberg up in his ivory tower and then occasionally comes down to Congress, which is, then it's a televised event. And there are cases and bills that are happening in New Hampshire where you can go and testify as a public citizen and talk about this. And then also at Citizens Count, we've had sort of a front row seat to all the things that can go wrong with social media because we have a very large Facebook presence. We have um, over 200,000 followers on Facebook and we post a daily policy issue in New Hampshire looking for discussion. And so over the past 10 years, we have seen huge changes in how many people see our posts, who see our posts, who comments, and it's this animal that's outside of our control and sometimes it can be kind of scary when you see who's coming in and who's being pulled to your content or it's not being shown to at all and you wonder why. So for me, like I said, it's, it's tying it to New Hampshire, tying it that as individuals we can get involved even in these big sticky topics. And then also just sharing some of my own personal experience with social media. Great, thank you. And we were really interested in having this New Hampshire perspective because the question before us this evening is can states, the several states, um, regulate social media. John, what made you want to do this? Besides the free drink. Free <laughs> drinks for the panelists. It comes out. That's not enough of a reason. Okay. Yes. Um, I just, I, I, as was shared, I teach constitutional law. I work at the Redmond Center where we have a lot of public events. Um, and so I love being engaged in the community and in engaging in community conversations about the Constitution. Um, I, I think Justin is, is our First Amendment expert tonight. Um, what I may be able to offer is, at a, at a more general level, how some of the, the maybe some of the trends and the, the fissures that we're already starting to see in, in this case um, connect with some other trends and fissures that we are seeing in other constitutional law cases. And if you have all been you know, in a coma, um, Supreme Court's been deciding a lot of constitutional law and changing what the Constitution means in a big way. Um, not just in the last week, um, but really um, you know, for the last couple of years now. Great, thank you. And, and with our last two panelists, we get this idea that there's this animal out there, that's social media, and uh, this particular case is going to have implications for how we Think about social media, perhaps, or what truly the question in front of us is what can states do about this animal that's out there? And uh, John will perhaps be able to also help us think about what some of the implications are of this case and how it could start to play out in other aspects of law. Because this is very much new territory for the court to be talking about First Amendment and social media. So uh, we created this little pamphlet uh, to give you a sense of what this uh, Texas law, um, and basically Texas passes a law and it um, makes it so that the state can oversee what is going on in social media that has to do with viewpoint, if they're censoring a particular viewpoint, or, and it also required that the platforms make clear their acceptable use policy so that people know who is able to be on the social media platform and who isn't. And they have to establish an appeals process. So if you're taken off the social media platform, you get to appeal. This Texas law only applies to dominant 
social media platforms, so the really big ones, not the very small ones. Uh, I did not put down the entire uh, law in our little pamphlet here. Um, but the key piece is, like, how did it get to the Supreme Court? And Allison, would you be willing to hold the mic for me? Because this is actually a two-handed demonstration. Nick had to do his finger with one. Okay, thank you, Allison. Uh, so basically, first step is that Texas passes a law. So you can remember that like this. Ooh, it's called promulgating. And the next thing after Texas passes that law is that NetChoice, who represents the social media platforms, says that's not good, that law uh, violates my First Amendment. And so they go to a d federal district court and the federal, thank you, federal district court goes and they enjoin the law. At which case, so the law doesn't work anymore. When I make the fist, the law doesn't work. So Texas goes, what do you mean? And so they take it to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and that court does this amazing thing. I'm going to look at my lawyers. They vacate the stay, which is different than a stay vacation. And so now the law is back into effect. And net choice goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court the emergency stay. So that's what goes to the Supreme Court. Everybody understand that? And the difference between oops, vacating the stay and a stay vacation? Just so long as you get that. All right. So, um, but when the court decided it would hear this, it granted this emergency stay. So the law is not in effect. And everybody wanted to know, how is the court thinking about this case? They are not. They didn't make an opinion, but how are they thinking about it? So Alito and several others, and it's an interesting coalition. It's not just the conservatives. It's Alito and Kagan, and now I can't remember, uh, Gorsuch? And Thomas. Yeah. Um, so they, even though the court put the law in that um, stay position, it could not be enforced, Alito and Kagan and others felt that that was a mistake, that Texas actually had a case. And uh, so if you open up and you see right here Justice Alito's dissent, there's just a couple things I want to bring to your attention. And that is that um, Alito was very interested in Texas's argument that net choice was kind of talking out of both sides of its mouth. Now, that's perfectly fine to do in the law, right? You get to have competing defenses, right? I'm, I'm turning to John. Yes, you can, you, can, you can say, I wasn't there, but if I was there, I was drunk. <laughs> yes. But even if I wasn't drunk, um, I didn't do it. Exactly. You do not have to be, it's totally okay. You do not have to be coherent. It's one of that Emersonian things about the foolish inconsistencies or something of that sort. You're allowed to do this. And uh, so Texas, though, is looking at what Net Choice is doing, and he goes, wait a minute, minute. Um, first of all, how can it be that Net Choice claims that it is, that the ruling law is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, and I put that in bold. This often comes up with social media. No provider shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So that makes it sound as if First Amendment may not pertain, because they're just a conduit. Um, and by the same time, they say, Net Short says, we are engaged in editorial discretion, and therefore we're protected under the First Amendment. You may need to scratch your head a little bit now because we've just been told that net choice operates under two conflicting laws. One is Section 230 and the other is the First Amendment. Lawyers will be able to distinguish these two. Constitutional wranglers just jump into the mud. Um, so you, you can find out a little bit more, but I won't go into all these details, but it may come up. Because another thing that Alito pointed to was a dissent from 1932, Justice Louis Brandeis. And it's one of those very famous passages 
in which Brandeis talks about seeing the states as laboratories of democracy. So that New Hampshire maybe wants to try something very specific around regulating social media. Texas is going to try its own thing about regulating social media. Uh, Florida has got some other proposal forward. And that the fact that Alito points to this Brandeis decision suggests that attorneys general, individual states, may have skin in the game. And it may not just be Congress and on the national level. It can bring it home to New Hampshire. So now I'm going to turn back to the panelists. And, and we'll do the same way forward in the same order, and then we'll reverse. So Justin, what would you like to say about this case? Just the whole issue uh, generally, entirely complicated, confusing, very difficult. I mean, just hearing about this case, the way it traveled up to the Supreme Court, the division of opinions within the Supreme Court, uh, the arguments that uh, are being made, it just shows you how difficult of uh, uh, a topic this is when we're talking about regulating social media and just more generally, like, what is social media? Uh, the debate really, I think, if, if we're going to boil it down, it, it comes down to, as you framed it, Meg, it's social media more like a traditional news outlet, a newspaper, in that it practices editorial discretion, it has certain algorithms that amplify messages, downplays others, or is it more like a common carrier or a neutral conduit that, excuse me, that, um, that can be more easily regulated, like a telephone company? Right? How the courts ultimately answer that question is going to have enormous consequences. Because if social media companies are to be considered more like traditional media, then the bar that government has to overcome in order to regulate them is very, very high. And for good reason. But if these social media companies are considered more like a common carrier, a neutral conduit, just a platform where people can go to express themselves, then it becomes much easier for government to regulate the speech that's on those platforms. So for me, my perspective, where I'm coming from, you know, I'm very skeptical, skeptical of government power, what it does with its power, it's a, the opportunities to abuse that power. So I'm not saying that there isn't some kind of legislative solution. Maybe there's a bill that could be very narrowly drawn that could address some of these issues. I'm not implying that social media should or should not be regulated. But I, what I would like everybody to consider as we move forward in this conversation are some of the risks that are at play when we have government determining for us, through social media companies, what speech should or should not be heard, what's misinformation, what's not misinformation, having government be the arbiter of truth when we have decades of uh, really strong First Amendment precedent saying that we, the people, we should be the arbiters of the truth, not government, that's not government's role. We have precedent saying that when it comes to newsroom operations, editorial discretion, government has no business making decisions for us what opinions we share. Has no business telling us that we should have opposing viewpoints in the pages of our newspaper. And when it comes to our ability to speak freely, we should be able to do so without fear that making a mistake sharing misinformation, uh, saying something that's inaccurate could ultimately lead us to be punished by government. So these are the things that I worry about. And again, I don't want to apply there isn't a legislative or a regulatory you know, solution here, but this is stuff that I think all of us just need to be aware of and keep in mind as we move forward talking about some of the bills that have been proposed in the various states. Can I just ask, oh good, I just had to check the volume. Um, so, is your organization taking a stand with respect to some of these uh, laws coming out of the states with respect to regulating social media? Well, we certainly may, if there are any in New England that are worth addressing. Our organization, my organization, New England First Amendment Coalition, our primary objective is to educate the public, to have conversations like these and to make people aware of the issues. But certainly, if there is some legislation that's proposed, a regulation within the New England states, which is where we focus, uh, you know, we would certainly take a stand if there's some First Amendment interests there that we think need to be articulated and protected. Great, thank you. Nick, what do you think about this case? Uh, there's a whole lot 
to think about with this case. One thing I'll say quite quickly is that it was not a Supreme Court decision. It's really important that we get this out of the way. It was not what we call a merits decision. This was decided on what is colloquially referred to as the shadow docket. The shadow docket is when the Supreme Court just says something and then it becomes law without going through all the rigmarole of, oh, having a trial and having a case and all that other stuff. Uh, just for a quick numbers, I'm a big numbers guy uh, in the Obama, combined, Obama and George W. Bush administrations, together, we're talking 16 years. Uh, there were, I think, eight rulings on the shadow docket, eight injunctions or stays, as so beautifully demonstrated. I'm envious for both of you. Um, eight times. How many times in the four years that Trump was president? I think it's 42. So the shadow docket is happening more and more and more. But in addition, I will say Supreme Court cases aside on the merits are happening on big issues too. Um, but what it means to me, uh, I was reading today about there are 17 countries in the world that have laws punishing you for misinformation regarding uh, coronavirus and vaccines and faulty treatments. Those countries, we are not one of those countries. Those countries are Cambodia, Russia, Vietnam, Thailand. These are countries with a more stringent rule on um, press and freedom of speech than we have in the United States. But the thing is, I don't know. This is why I'm here and I'm going to pass the mic real fast to hear what Anna says about New Hampshire, but uh, I work in the press. I work in a press room at New Hampshire Public Radio, just right there. You can see it out the window to Pillsbury Street. And misinformation when I was a child is not misinformation that I see today on Twitter. Um, one of our reporters at New Hampshire Public Radio had her window broken with a brick. And she has a one-year-old kid who was playing in the room. And a brick came through the window because, perhaps, of her investigative journalism, right? We are, we are, you know, we are in an age when the press is at odds with people who are sometimes misinformed. And it's different than when I was a kid. I never knew, I, I used to carry the newspaper for the Concord Monitor and nobody ever threw a brick through anybody's window at the Concord Monitor when I was a kid. I just think we're in a different era and that we can't let the free market decide w what to do with misinformation. That's how it used to be and that's how it's been for a long time. I don't know what the answer is and I don't know if it's capital G federal government who's gonna take care of business. I just think that it's worth thinking and talking a little bit more about. So, Nick, to, if I just make yeah. sure I'm clear, it sounds like you would be open, perhaps, to New Hampshire taking a role in deciding what should be on dominant social media platforms. Meg, I, I know that federalism is the most important facet of our government. We are 50 unique states, but if this week has taught me anything, it's to, I have a personal vested interest in moments that the federal government, in addition to the state government, can look at big issues like this. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't, I can't see 50 individual kingdoms mm -hmm. deciding how to deal with press misinformation and then somehow I cross the lines to Delaware and I say a tweet about this and I get arrested. You know, I just, I, I like thinking of it in big sweeping strokes because that's the week it has been for me. Okay, I, I won't tell Justice Brandeis you said that. So we're, we're talking about what's happening in the states and what could maybe be solutions coming from the states. And to Nick's point, I don't know what the solution is. There's, there are dozens of solutions. And I did also look at the federal level and there have been dozens of bills introduced at the federal level. It seems that everyone seems to be united. It does seem to bring both people across the aisle together that Facebook sucks. Everyone seems to agree <laughs> there's a problem. But when you look at, okay, what's the solution? There's very different approaches. So the case that we're looking at now came from a Republican perspective that was very much prompted by what was happening at then President Donald Trump on social media, being banned from Facebook, banned from Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was we need to compel people to keep, or compel social media companies to keep people, to keep speech on their platforms. But then there's laws in the other direction when you're looking, for example, to coronavirus misinformation that's saying we need to compel these companies to take speech off their platforms and control that. So then the question does become, is it, is it the federal government or is it the states? And then if it's the states, what would the solution be? So there are some states that are looking at t very specific types of content where I think probably if I had a crystal ball, I'd say if anything's gonna happen, it's gonna be in this area. And it's looking specifically at children and teens. Mm -hmm. 
on social media. So for example, Minnesota had a bill that would have banned algorithms that target children. California had a bill that would allow parents to sue if social media companies were not taking adequate steps to address addiction among children with social media. And then in New Hampshire, we had one that wasn't this sort of child angle, uh, which it was HB 133 from 2021, which would allow an individual to sue social media companies for censoring religious or political speech. So kind of similar to the Texas angle, more of the compelling you have to allow the speech as opposed to compelling take certain speech down. And I think it's interesting when you look at how that debate played out in New Hampshire, which is generally at the, t at the current time with the legislature, and I think a lot of our traditions are very sort of minimal government intervention, sort of that libertarian viewpoint often, and in the committee report to kill the bill, and the, the House agreed with the committee report and killed the bill, they were concerned particularly that New Hampshire might be an unfriendly place to business if suddenly we're the only state out there that has these laws that are unfriendly to social media companies. And the idea was, so this should be a federal government issue because it might disadvantage New Hampshire, it would create confusion for businesses. Um, so, so that's a little bit of color on sort of breaking down the different policy ideas and, and that's, that's just a small flavor of ideas people have come up with and I definitely think we will see lots of proposals related to this in the next legislative session in New Hampshire because 400 state reps, 24 state senators, even if each of them introduce one or two bills, we're looking at a thousand bills a year. So definitely I'm, I'm ready to see what comes out with this. And, and it sounds like um, you're saying that because the laboratories of democracy may sound like a great theory, but in reality, states are very competitive and they want to have the same market conditions. Yes, and also, I'm not sure if we addressed the idea of laboratories of democracy, which, for quick for the audience as a concept, the idea is that each state can kind of be its own little science experiment. What works, what policy works, what policy doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So it's hard when you're looking at an, a national company, international company, um, and it, it's also worth going to, I'm just going to throw out there too, in the case of Facebook and Twitter, inevitably going to be impacted by what are the laws in Europe? How are they going to regulate social media? Because they're going to have to comply with that, even though their, their company is based in the U.S. and we're thinking all about how it impacts U.S. elections. Great, great. Thank you very much. John, what, what are your thoughts on this case? Did it work? We're afraid of the work. Yeah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid <laughs> of this one. Um, is this one working now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, um, just a couple of pre preliminary thoughts. First thing is just to remind that, yeah, laboratories of democracy and federalism is an important part of our system of government. Separation of powers is an important part of our system of government, but so is individual rights. And um, the First Amendment's five rights uh, are individual rights that, that trump the interests uh, of the federal government in regulating in ways that intrude upon those rights and also trump the interests of the states and their subdivisions in regulating on ways that intrude upon these rights. So, you know, we can point to the, to the, to the virtues of states as laboratories of experiment in, in lots of situations, although not all, as, as was made clear. Um, but that rationale never allows for an overriding of our fundamental rights. Um, and here, you know, the issue in this case is an issue of free speech, which is mm -hmm. a fundamental right. Um, one of the other things I think is really interesting about this, now I have some students here and I'm gonna ask them to plug my ears, their ears, because I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use some terminology that I always talk about how much I hate in class. And I'm gonna talk about conservative and liberal. Um, and, and just to be clear, why are those two terms you feel like you want to stay away from them? Because that feels important. Because words are signifiers, right? And, and, and those words signify such different things mm -hmm. to different people. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity for talking past one another, mm -hmm. I think, is really exacerbated when we use words like conservative and liberal as shortcuts. Um, because just to take conservative, for example. I mean, there are political conservatives. There's what this Supreme Court is doing right now. That's a version of conservatism that many people, that might leap to mind for many people. You know, a sort of mm -hmm. radical transformation of going back. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's like Edwin Burkean conservatism, mm -hmm. you know, and David Souter conservatism, mm -hmm. which is incremental steps, take in the data, see how it works. Those are very, very different things, but it's the same word, and it connotes different things to different audiences. So, so I, with reluctance, 
What I'd like to say is that uh, many commentators who, uh, and those who are interested in the First Amendment, and I'm focusing on free speech in particular, have talked about how in recent years, uh, this, the First Amendment has become a darling uh, of conservatives, um, and in particular, uh, a, a darling of, uh, of, of empowered conservative groups. Um, you know, when I first learned, when I went to law school and I read First Amendment cases, it was people saying, F the draft, mm -hmm. you know, or it was people who were, uh, who were, you know, taking, you know, or pushing the limits with respect to, to films and were being charged with obscenity. And, you know, it was, it was the little guy, you know, and the First Amendment was there to protect the little guy or the war protester, whoever it might be. I mean, uh, and ma many, many people, this isn't me, that many, many people have noted how in recent years, the big First Amendment cases that have gone to the Supreme Court have been on behalf of empowered entities, you know, with, you know, pharmaceutical companies won a big case at the Supreme Court a few years ago um, when Vermont and New Hampshire, by the way, tried to regulate the release of data to pharmaceutical companies about the prescribing patterns of doctors because that data was being used by sales representatives to go into doctor's order offices uh, who, were, who were adopting new medications, which are much more lucrative for the pharmaceutical companies. And so the states, as laboratories of democracy, stepped in and tried to say, we don't want that data released to pharmaceutical companies. First Amendment violation. Um, as you know, there have been efforts to reduce the, uh, regulate the amount of money in politics, right? The Supreme Court has said, First Amendment violation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, these aren't, this isn't, you know, this isn't... These are uh, not the little guys. This isn't, you know, Cohen with his F the draft on his, on his coat. This, these are billionaires who are pouring dark money into our elections to control their outcomes. What occurred to me about this case, so, and there's plenty more examples. There have been lots and lots of cases where establishment figures have won claims recently under the First Amendment. And, and, and quite honestly, and this, is, this comes out of a study that was, uh, you know, that was written up by Lee Epstein and it was, you know, was written about by Adam Liptak in the New York Times. I mean, conservatives, the conservative side, you know, we have, we have to pick a side between the conservative and liberal side. The conservative side is winning far more often than not in First Amendment cases in recent years. Um, and most of the cases that the Supreme Court are taking in recent years are, are being brought by conservative interests. So what about this case is different? Um, and what I think is really interesting here is, here, it's not a question of whether the First Amendment applies to protect pharmaceutical companies or you know, entrenched interests. Here, it's, it's reversed. Um, I think, ordinarily, we would think any state law that tells a private entity what it can say and what it can, can communicate and what it can't, I mean, that's like a heartland First Amendment violation, right? And Facebook and Twitter, these are not government agencies. These are private companies. Mm -hmm. And so at first blush, state laws like Texas's law, you know, which come at it, again, from sort of a Trump-friendly perspective, but also some of these other state laws which actually come at it from quite the opposite perspective. I mean, they Public have- Public health issues. Yes, exactly. They have a serious hurdle to get over, right? In, 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 in arguing for regulation of speech by private entities. And here what we see is the three most conservative members of the Supreme Court, the three justices who are leading a radical transformation in American constitutional law right before our eyes, Clarence Thomas, um, Samuel Alito, and Neil Gorsuch. We see the three of them regularly um, saying, we have to take a different look at this. And those are the three who signed on to Justice Alito's opinion, suggesting these entities aren't like private companies, they're more like common carriers, right? Um, well, whew. That's a pretty radical suggestion. And that would be, lead to a conclusion that the First Amendment doesn't apply in circumstances where I think many of us who work in this area would say, come on, that's obviously unconstitutional. So it, the, the point is, it goes both ways. The First Amendment can be extended to conduct, to speech, to communication, not on behalf of the little guy, but on behalf of the powerful. I mean, Donald Trump has a platform. Donald Trump is not somebody who's relatively unempowered <laughs> with respect to communicating to the American people, right? Um, but it, so sometimes, you know, there's been this recent move towards expanding the First Amendment to protect that sort of communication, but it can go the other way. First Amendment protections can also be withdrawn or withheld in circumstances where many would say they ought to apply. Um, and that would change the law in a really big way as well, but leading to a similar outcome, advancing the interests 
uh, of those who hold a lot of power already in society. And especially in the context of, come on, with the Texas law, this is not valuable speech. This is not valuable speech. This is, um, this is th misinformation, right? You know, this is, this is speech that's harming our polity, you know? So it's, there's no sort of sense of, like, this is, this is coming from the margins from some viewpoint where, you know, people who, uh, you know, have never really thought about things. And it's just not like the traditional 1960s First Amendment case. So th this is, th so we have another strong argument on the table right now, and that is that the First Amendment was an important individual right and it protected uh, the little guy against powerful entities, which were governments. But what do we do when it's not the little guy, it's governments and very, very powerful private corporations? And are, are you willing to say, I, I, you don't have to say this, you can take the fifth, but are you willing to <laughs> consider that this idea that the First Amendment no longer applies under these circumstances? No. That troubles me, and I think, I mean, I think oh, this maybe. is sort of the flip side of the coin. You know, the, the term that Justice Elena Kagan used in 2018 to talk about this trend was the weaponized First Amendment. And Elena, Justice Elena Kagan is not some fire-breathing radical. You know, for her to use language right. like that, she is a moderate justice. And this was in the case that um, struck down as unconstitutional the requirement that public employees uh, pay dues to support public unions. Um, the, the, it was held in this case that there's a First Amendment right not to pay dues to a public, mm -hmm. uh, to a public um, employee union if you don't want to. But she talked about how the First Amendment has really been weaponized on behalf of the haves, the empowered in our society. Mm -hmm. And I think this case presents an interesting way to think about that, but from the perspective of perhaps withdrawing First Amendment protections where they otherwise would presumptively lie, rather than extending them to the powerful. But s similar result at the end of the day. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm going to guess that Justin may have something to say to that. Am I right? And then um, I'm going to start to open it up. I'm keeping my eyes out to the audience. Feel free to wrangle to jump into this constitutional discussion. Um, and so we'll... we'll you just raise your hands or shout out that? Or, what's the or, or you have, if you have an interpretive dance that shows different things, whatever, uh, just get our attention. Uh, do we also have things on the table? People have cards. So if you feel more comfortable, you, there's index cards on the table and you want to write a question, some lovely person will bring it up to me. So that's another option. But, uh, okay, Bill wants to jump in, then I'm going to go to Justin. I, I'm going to give you a microphone, Bill. Well, thanks to all the panelists for very thoughtful and enlightening discussions. And speaking of the Enlightenment, I have a question that I'd like to ask all the panelists that goes back before the forming of the United States, which goes back to Voltaire. And this is a uh, letter that he wrote to a colleague. And in the letter he says that, I dis well, I disapprove, not disagree, but I disapprove of what you say I will defend to the death your right to say that. Mm -hmm. Is that relevant guidelines for today's possible legislation? All right, and, and so we have a Voltaire quote, and I think that has been attributed to many, but this is an important idea. I will defend to the death your right to say something stupid, or something to that effect. Um, Anna wants to jump in. Well, I, that's one thing I've actually been thinking about lately, because once again, I, I was, was talking to John before the panel, and, and today when I was getting ready, I was listening to, there's so many podcasts one could listen to, and it was looking about the regulation of social media, but particularly, all right, let's look at this in the international context. I'm usually all at the state level, and uh, one of the people on the podcast, pardon me, I don't remember who, pointed out that we are so frequently thinking about what does this look like in the United States, how would this play out here, but if you go, okay, let's say to Russia, right? And you see how government getting involved in what can and cannot be posted on social media having very deadly consequences, all right? The, the, my understanding is that the majority of the population, or, or maybe not the majority, but a large number of the pop people in Russia believe that there's some sort of Nazi genocide happening in, in Ukraine, which my understanding is that's not what's going on in Ukraine. So you can see the importance of that. And I think where the nuance comes in for me is that these social media companies, it's not necessarily what they are allowing or not allowing to appear in the first place, but what gets amplified. 
And that's, that's a word that's come up. I've heard Justin use the word amplify. I, I heard John use the word amplify. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it from you, Nick. You're just missing the boat. But the, the idea is that algorithms are going to push certain things out more than others. And the idea that also share buttons in particular make it very easy to very quickly spread information as opposed to just the ability to stand up, say, at a town hall meeting and, and say whatever awful, untrue, mystery misinformation you would like and then you sit down and everyone gets their chance to sort of evaluate that on an equal level playing field. So I and I think that's partly when you they talk about it in the ruling being a conduit. I think that's partly the slightly different way of thinking about it. You, you think about it something what you're regulating at that point isn't the speech itself, but rather how it is being shared many times or, or not many times. So that, that, that's a nuance we haven't really gotten into yet, but, but one that I'm really mulling over because I agree with that fundamental premise that if we do just let the government say what you can and can't say, regardless of the platform, we, we know that's a very dangerous road. Right. So technology versus content. Content, you're saying we could think about it in terms of free speech, but if it's just the algorithms and the technology, that's more like the conduit. I, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm still figuring it out myself because I yes. also do not have a JD and I'm not a constitutional scholar, but that's where I'm gray. That's where right. I get into the gray area. Well, I'm going to guess that Justin is going to have something to say about this. Well, actually, to Anna's point uh, about amplifying the algorithms, something that I keep coming back to, uh, particularly during these types of discussions, is that we don't know what those algorithms are. I mean, here we are debating the wisdom of regulating social media to cure all of social media's ills and to make sure that we're uh, informed with accurate information, not misinformation, but we don't really know what the problem is because there isn't any transparency within these social media companies about how they're deciding what to amplify and what not. So we have you know, bills like the one in, in, in Texas and Florida that are uh, requiring, would require social media companies to express, uh, to host all viewpoints, to not be biased in any way, to compel speech they wouldn't otherwise. But we don't really know what's going on behind the curtain to begin with. And I think it's really difficult for us to address the problem in any kind of meaningful way without knowing why social media companies are doing what they're doing and what's going on behind that curtain. So I would. I mean, I would even propose before we start discussing uh, ways to regulate uh, the speech that's occurring on these platforms, why not consider having some kind of transparency requirement? Or if you're a social media company, maybe like voluntarily in good practice, like share with the public why you are operating the way you are, how content is moderated, and give all of us a better understanding of like, what's going on so we can better determine what the problem is and better address it. And, and just to uh, bring this back to this particular case, Texas wanted those two things. They wanted transparency, unacceptable use policy, and then to a certain degree they're asking for due process to establish an appeals process. So I'm just checking out with you, would you feel like a, a bill that did that sort of regulation not content, so I'm keeping the, um, you have to uh, make sure all the content is up there, but just the, the tools to get there, the more procedural, sorry. So devil's in the details, right? We don't know what the bill would look like, but I think requiring transparency on behalf of social media companies, rather than targeting the speech itself, would be on sure First mm -hmm. Amendment footing mm -hmm. than some of the bills that, that we're seeing now. Right. Uh, it also goes to just, generally the difference between social media companies and uh, traditional media, right? We can pick up a newspaper and we can see what stories are being prioritized because they're on A1 and not buried in the mm -hmm. back pages. We don't know really what other people on social media, on Facebook are seeing relative to our own accounts. Um, so to answer your question, uh, and to sound like an attorney, it depends. Yeah. It but, depends. But I, I do think that might be a safer route to go than targeting the speech Exactly. Itself. So, uh, fast so follow okay, follow fast follow-up, because then I'll get to my line. I understand there's a question, but so, uh, John, I need your help, I need your help. What's the Supreme Court case that decided that the speech of burning a cross on someone's lawn was protected? RAV versus St. Paul. Okay, right. So, so Sorry, I, it's one that I really Thank you all so much. So, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Virginia B. Black. It, it, what it said, what, 
what it said was that it couldn't be punished based on the viewpoint that it expressed. Burning a cross on someone's lawn is something that can be punished. Right, that can be punished, but the viewpoint, okay. So this is, and this brings up this notion, which I think is addressed in this case, this notion of viewpoint discrimination, right? And to your question, Bill, um, my father, that was his favorite quote. You know, I, I was born and he like shook that Voltaire quote, which maybe wasn't Voltaire, but he shook it into me since I was a, basically a fetus. So um, I just think it's, it's, I love that quote and I love every, every social studies teacher whom I work with today and I adore says the problem in America is civil discourse. We used to talk and we don't talk anymore. Maybe that's true. At the same time, I would respect as my old First Amendment teacher, Mike Brown said, you know, you have a right to march around in a clan hood, and I have the right to sit on the bridge and throw rocks at you. Now, I know I don't have a right to throw rocks at you. I was going to say, isn't that... But, but I know, I don't necessarily, but maybe like sort of metaphorical rocks. I'm just saying, every, to John's point about the First Amendment protecting the little guy, I think that's interesting. There's one time that I read of where a company was restricted in terms of... Um, a company was punished for restricting speech, and that was when you had company towns, like I owe my soul to the company store, right? You, and, and if you lived in a company town and you were paid in company scrip, and you, you were in the mines, you, and you were in the town square, and you said, you know what, I hate the company, you could get arrested for that. And that was like the only time a corporation that I could find from Googling was punished for um, restricting the speech of someone else. And that's the story of the little guy kind of coming up against the First Amendment in a new way. So I, I just wanted to echo John's point that I think it's important to think about who is the person advocating for protection under the First Amendment. Thank okay. you. Okay. So All right. We're going to have to make some big distinctions. Who gets it and who doesn't? And who will decide? So we have one card, which I'm going to read, and then we have a question here, and I saw a woman there. So we'll make sure we get more from the public. Um, here's a, f a question for the all panelists. What happened to the Fairness Doctrine? And what was it meant to do originally? Who would like to take the Fairness Doctrine? Okay, Justin. So the Fairness Doctrine, uh, it's about a case called Redline, and essentially what it's all about is that uh, it was a requirement on uh, public airwaves that if you're going to express one particular viewpoint, because you're using the public airwaves through broadcast or radio, you then need to provide an opposite viewpoint. You can't just monopolize public airwaves that belong to the public to share just one opinion. There has to be some fairness about it. Um, and ultimately what happened with the Fairness Doctrine, this Red Lion case, this Fairness Doctrine was uh, eventually upheld by the Supreme Court. What's happened in the many years since is that the FCC has essentially said, you know, we're not going to enforce the Fairness Doctrine. Supreme Court got it wrong. Uh, this is not, uh, a, a, the First Amendment uh, doesn't allow government to compel that kind of speech. So every now and then we'll hear arguments about the Fairness Doctrine. Well, you know, I, I hear it a lot, not even with public airways, but just like with the newspaper or other, you know, private medium where, okay, you know, they have a, uh, the accusation is, is that they have some kind of bias coverage. Why can't they be forced to put in an opposing viewpoint? Why can't they be forced to give other information? Well, it all comes down to this idea of compelled speech. And the First Amendment really looks down upon the government's ability to compel us to speak. A lot of times we're talking about free speech and government's ability to restrict what we say. Well, there's many uh, First Amendment cases that deal with government's ability or inability to force us to say things as well, and that's uh, really where the Fairness Doctrine comes. So the Fairness Doctrine does not compel speech? The Fairness Doctrine was intended to, but it's no longer enforced by the FCC. It's no longer in play, but every now and then you will hear calls for it to be enforced and to have some kind of uh, quote-unquote fairness reflected on our public airwaves. Great, thank you. In, in the wake, so fast, in yeah. the wake of the Fairness Doctrine basically being overturned, that was the birth of conservative talk radio. Like you couldn't have that before. If I, you know, if any of you listen to Rush Limbaugh, that started like, what, 1987? You start, suddenly you see 100% biased, often with misinformation, at the time, majority conservative talk radio uh, that had no opposition. Uh, and uh, news stations like I work for, NHPR, you see a talk show the way you, you say that you're a fair and balanced institution, okay, we're talking climate change. We gotta have someone in the room who says climate change is real, so that means we have to have this guy over here who says it's fake. 
that's how we're, I guess that's what we do in news now. That's just, I know we don't do that anymore, but that's right. just what we so do. So we can all know fairness doctrine does not compel speech. We don't have to listen to those arguments anymore. And you heard it here. We have a man here who's been very patient. Sure. The question I have is for the panel, when it comes to the kind of the famous anecdote, and I can't remember the justice, you do not have the First Amendment right to yell fire in a movie theater. Is there a social media analog to that that you can envision, whether it relates to COVID misinformation or anything that's going on today in our very polarized society? Okay. What does that look like? John, do you want to take this? Sure. Um, that was Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, who used that metaphor. That was in, you know, um, uh, Nick made reference to the fact that it was 1920. Um, it was, you know, people think of the, our First Amendment free speech freedoms going back to the founding. Uh-uh. Uh, I mean, the early days of the Republic involved the Alien and Sedition Acts where people being thrown into prison for expressing criticism of the government. That sort of stuff happened right into the early 20th century. Um, the idea, though, is that, of course, the government at some point um, has an interest in preventing something that's a clear and present danger from causing injury. Um, that idea has subsequently been fleshed out in the, the clear and present danger test. Um, Brandenburg versus Ohio makes that a very, very hard showing to meet. And so simply being a conduit for false information, even false information that people may act upon to their detriment and to their harm, that's not enough to, to fall within that exception as First Amendment doctrine is currently crafted. Great, thank you. Um, do you want to ask a question? And can you just say your name? Um, Zib Carell. Zib, thank you. So I'm here as every man, every woman, or little guy, uh, not lawyer. Um, and operative words that I'm picking up on and that I care about are fairness. Fairness. And, and when Ann mentioned the typical town hall scenario or meeting or public place where you can be heard, uh, even in that setting, there's an imbalance. There's lack of equality in who gets to be heard. You, know, you often see the people who dominate the discussion and the people who are a little too timid to raise their hand. I think the average person, not the ones who have to figure out those details, care more about what's fair. And unfortunately, many of us are focused and maybe nauseated by what's coming out of the courts and that's not the laws that be, are being put on the books, but it's how the court is responding. Much of it doesn't feel fair. And while we can argue, well, that the laws aren't about ensuring that you're treated fairly, in fact, that's what our values in most cultures are about, that we want fairness. And I would argue uh, that the courts, for many years, have been leaning much more towards corporations. I don't know how to pose that as a question, but, but, right. that's, but that's, that's building the emotional you, side yeah. rather than sort of the pragmatic right. side. And, and that was something that John got to in his court watching, uh, having a sense that plaintiffs in these cases seem to be coming from more corporate not the little guy. That and the notion of weaponizing. I was so pleased to hear you say, I don't really know where I am on this. Yeah. Because most of us believe staunchly in First Amendment rights. Probably a bunch of us are mm -hmm. ACL members. Mm -hmm. But to what end? To, to how what far? end? Yeah, yeah nice. How far? That's a great question. I, I want to give panelists a chance. I know I've got a couple other cards, and we're going to definitely get to those cards. But that's a really big question. Who would like to take what Zib is putting on the table? To what ends, First Amendment, and maybe how far do these protections go? This is, a, this is getting into the mud. That's what we want. Justin, you want to try this? I see you're moving. I will try. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this question. That's a really great question. Um, thank you for asking it. And it's a difficult one to answer. I, I think for me, to, to what, what I look for when it comes to the First Amendment advocacy, I mean, that's my job, right? Like, oh, I recognize that. I'm here as a First Amendment advocate. And what I look for is consistency. You know, that's really what's most important to me. Is the law established and is it applied consistently? 
And I believe, and, and if anybody disagrees, please, you know, let me know. Let me hear your thoughts. But I believe if we can apply the law consistently, then ultimately the, the little guy will do okay and will be protected. And it may mean that we have to defend the rights of some very despicable people. It may mean that we have to go out of our way to raise our hand and say, hey, that's not right. That person, even though they have views that I vehemently disagree with, they have the right to express them. But in doing so, if we can be consistent in our own beliefs and how we apply the law, ultimately, the minority voice, the little man, however you want to describe it, but that the person who isn't as empowered will be protected. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I look for. And that ultimately really is uh, the, one of the biggest challenges that I have to face, uh, particularly with, and we were talking about it earlier, particularly with younger individuals who are very quick to say, yes, I support the First Amendment but then qu very quick to say, well, well, pump the brakes mm -hmm. if we're gonna apply it to that person or that group, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so how far do we go with it? For me, it's all about consistency and we take it as far as the law will allow us, but to make sure that we're being consistent in both our beliefs and the application of the law. So fairness is consistency, same procedures, and, and, and things will work out as long as we just stay consistent, apply the law equally, to d depending on Power. I, I believe so. I think where we get in trouble is when we find that different parties or individuals, based on how much power they have, aren't treated like others, that it's not consistent. And that's where I think we uh, run afoul of the uh, First Amendment. Right. Does anyone else want to jump in on, on the panel on this? Yeah. Oh, you, you want to answer this question? No, I don't want to answer. Sorry, I don't want to okay. answer it. Okay, all right. You got another question. All right, I have my cue. I have you. And, and so let me open up a card. And my guess is this fairness question is going to keep coming again and again. So procedural justice and robots. That's what this one is. Amplification can happen via a bot. Can they be regulated? Would that be a violation of the First Amendment? What are the free speech rights of bots? Did you want to answer that? Thumbs up. John, you want to take it? Um, sure. I, 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 like to, I like to talk about sort of the, the, the two ends of the spectrum in terms of interpreting the Constitution. Um, I think you can, you can helpfully start by dividing the world into two. There are those who say that interpreting, in interpreting the Constitution, let justice reign though the heavens may fall. We don't care about what the consequences are of our ruling. Uh, we think that the justices, that the judges ought to interpret the Constitution to say what it means and to mean what it says. Um, and um, so, great ex Second Amendment case from last week, right? Um, it, may be, it may lead to good policy, may lead to bad policy, but it has a meaning. Um, there's a text that says the right shall not be abridged. Um, and unless there's a historical analog that allows for abridgment of the right, um, that's what the Constitution doesn't allow. So that's one side of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum is captured by Justice Jackson said this, um, the Bill of Rights is not a suicide pact, right? Um, and so first, I think one has to identify themselves as, you know, where, do you, where does one fall on that spectrum? How persuasive do you find the arguments that the greater danger comes from judges imposing their own values when they don't simply act like archaeologists and historians to figure out what this provision was meant to mean at the time it became law. That's the ascended view on the Supreme Court right now. It does not, we do not take consequences into account. Justice Breyer is probably the foremost advocate for consequentialism, and he's retiring from the court. Um, presumably, his replacement will care about consequences too, but right now it's about a 6-3 split, probably more of a 5-4 split, I think, on that question. So, Robots. that frames then the, the question. You know, I mean, we need more facts, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the First Amendment should be an absolute. Um, and it isn't an absolute. There are all sorts of situations where free speech rights give way, and there are plays in the joints in doctrine that allow you to characterize it as this way rather than that way, which allows for a little more regulation in certain contexts. I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with judges of good faith bringing our Constitution to life so that it's not only our Constitution, but it's a good Constitution for a 21st century society that includes all sorts of 
people and interests that were not represented in the Constitution, frankly, when every major part of it was written. Yeah, right. So do you see people behind the robots? Because I'm trying to get this idea, like, we have bots out there. Is this autonomous technology? Is it operating on its own? Is it just the technology of somebody else? Is it get 14th Amendment protections? This is a whole, Anna, Anna called social media a strange animal, I think. It turns out there's bots in its intestines. Well, there, you know, but, you know, people say, can we, could we, can we get out of, you know, our, our bias problems with AI? And then, I don't, I mean, I don't, I, I was a Latin major, so, you know, I don't understand anything. But I, I do sort of gravitate to the idea that the programmers, that their biases and prejudices make their way into the algorithms that yeah. generate yeah. the bots that make these decisions. Anna wants to add. Well, I, I just wanted to touch on the fact, I, I would love the idea about how, if this could just like totally turn into a sci-fi conversation about whether <laughs> intelligent robots have free speech rights. But I really do think that it comes back to also this um, I, I am immediately brought to mind the concept of corporations having personhood under the law. Because once again, we're talking, someone's creating this technology. Do they have a right to create technology that's going to amplify certain voices or not amplify? Is the creation of that technology their version of free speech, even though it's a, a giant corporation? I think, you know, that would, that I would not be sure if that's been a question that's answered, really been answered mm -hmm. in the courts. If the technology you create is sort of like an extension of your speech, is that something that's been adjudicated that you're aware of? If it has, uh, Justin, I don't know. Yeah, short answer is I don't know, but I, I, cool. <laughs> uh, I do believe there, have, there is some case law that says there's some creative expression behind algorithms. So algorithms are created by people, so the argument would go when that person has, is, exp the argument is, is that that person is expressing themselves in some kind of creative way to develop that, ag that algorithm, which would then uh, warrant some kind of First Amendment protection. Where things start to shift from that individual uh, you know, human involvement to having something be so automated that there's no longer a person behind the scenes you know, tweaking the levers and having any involvement in, in the production, I don't know where that line is. Um, I'm not sure it's a question that has been answered, but um, there are some, some hints. Well, I think cases. we also all need to keep in mind that if the courts don't answer these questions, I think legislatures are eventually going to try to. Thank because you. I also look at, when you look at the evolution, for, so my background, I thought I might be a lawyer or go into law enforcement at one point, and so I, that was part of my master's in justice studies was study of criminal law. and. There's a, a long historical evolution of how different technology was mm -hmm. interpreted to violate or not violate uh, the Fourth Amendment. You know, mm -hmm. when we're looking at legal searches and seizures, all right, tapping telephones, putting GPS trackers on cars, they all went through an evolution where at one point cops were using them and it, it was totally accepted in the courts. Many people were convicted and then ultimately, either through legislation or through Supreme Court rulings, this said, no, oh, it's new technology, but we're going to apply the Constitution in this way. Right. So I, I would put social media in that. You know, we're having this conversation because it's the beginning, but yeah. it's not the end. I, their government is going to get involved in eventually one way or another. Right. And to underscore that point, if the courts don't talk, legislatures will need to, which means citizens need to be pretty informed to be watching this whole thing. Um, there was a hand up at the bar, and then I, I have another card here. So kind of going back to the, you know, the original question, should the states be regulating these social media? I guess this might be more of a practical question, a constitutional question. But, you know, the, the idea of the states being laboratories for democracy, and maybe kind of a, a parallel as we think about automobile regulations, right, in the state of California, will impose these much, these, these much more stringent automobile regulations than the rest of the states will have, and because that's such a dominant market, the automobile companies just have to, just have to adhere to these things, right? So, so. Right, and so California has this ability to, it's, it's, so it's not so much a, an isolated laboratory of democracy, right, where they have these overarching effects. And you wouldn't really think about there being a state where one case has a really strong, where has a really strong automobile policy, and some other states like, no, you have to have more than this. Like, yeah. You can't think of there being, 
but you could imagine there'd be one state that says you have to remove this certain type of content and then another state saying no you can't remove this sort of content and I can't imagine that Facebook is going to tailor its algorithm to Rhode Island is going to get different content but New Jersey is going to get this sort of content and so isn't there actually kind of more just a practical danger to individual states having these these regulations that will end up could end up being like, well, okay, maybe Facebook just doesn't operate in this one state. Yeah, yeah. So, and can you just tell us your name? Clayton Mashad. Clayton, thank you, Clayton. So, and I know Anna wants to jump in this. I thought when you began to ask your question that you were gonna say, hey, states can be laboratory democracy and can uh, actually have a fair amount of leverage. Yes, if you're California, probably more so than Rhode Island. But then you started to say, but that's gonna be too hard on the corporations. Now, I, didn't, I, wasn't, I don't want to say, that you, Clayton, that you were sympathetic to the plight of Mark Zuckerberg. I, I, I didn't put that in your mouth, but, but so it, this is kind of interesting. Like, you can see it both sides, it seems like, in your question. Anna, what, do you want, what are you thinking about this? I was just imme immediately brought to mind that my understanding is that Facebook is already doing this to an extent related to different nations. Mm. So I think that they do have that capability and, and to different nations in ways that is sometimes disturbing I think you know when you're looking at them sort of cooperating with things that are happening in China maybe you know um, and, and other more sort of authoritarian regimes and agreeing to remove content um, on these platforms so I think that it, it could potentially work but I also think if we're looking at it on a practical level in the United States there's a big difference between a California versus a Rhode Island or New Hampshire and I'm even brought to mind when you're looking at remote work, there are, there are many different state laws about how that's taxed and what's allowed and what is required. And you will notice that certain job listings will say, you can't apply to this job in your, if you're in Colorado, because they oh, just wow. aren't going to abide by those laws of remote work for Colorado. So mm -hmm. that, that's the risk. It's, the, the, the company does, I think Facebook in particular is a massive company. That I honestly think that they could probably uh, create different algorithms for different states and abide by different laws, but they also have enough power that they could just choose not to just go out of that state. Right. Of course, would that be practical when you know it's the internet? It's not like physical presence. That's a whole other conversation. Right, Dick, did you want to jump well, in? I mean, I have a bunch of things I want to ask about that. Um, it's 50 million, right? What's the what's the cap for the business? 50 million. So it's basically like Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. right? It's not Parler. Coincidentally, right? It's not these smaller social media enterprises that are going to be restricted. It's just the big ones, and it is predominantly to you know to empower conservative people such as the former president. Um, I think just to my res my response though to what you said, uh, I love your T-shirt by the way, I love your Vonnegut T-shirt, is states indeed can be laboratories to democracy, but sometimes they can. I feel like they can be a laboratory for the opposite. Um, a, a case I love dearly, Loving v. Virginia, which is the case that, you know, mandated it. You, 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 you can't say somebody can't marry somebody else because they're, they're different races, right? Interracial marriage is protected. Uh, it wasn't until, if I'm not mistaken, 1991 for all laws against that to be removed from Alabama's legislation, right? It takes a long time for the states to do other things as well in terms of they can create new things, but they can take their sweet time and respecting rights of people as well. Uh, and my last point was that I wish that there was somebody, and be grateful if uh, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson fulfills this role as someone who knows what Twitter is, or Facebook. Uh, it'd be nice, because if we're going to be regulating social media and we don't have anybody of those nine people who understands it, I feel like that's an injustice. I mean, there can be some great amicus folks saying what well, this is what Twitter is, but it brings to mind uh, Morse v. Frederick, where Justice Breyer is like, you know, bong hits for Jesus. What's that about? My goodness. Uh, I just think that'd be nice. <laughs> okay, thank you. I've got a card here uh, about Citizens United. Citizens United seems to have opened wide the door to allow powerful corporations to benefit from First Amendment protection of free speech. As Mitt Romney declared, corporations are people too. What impact do you think this might have on other First Amendment rights such as religion, press, assembly, petition. So is this basic idea that corporations are people too, is that gonna have these other rights as well? Anybody wish to wade in? John, great. And then I know I'm gonna to turn to you next. I'm gonna give a quick 
book recommendation, which is called uh, We the Corporations by a, a, a guy named Adam Winkler who teaches at UCLA Law School. And he, in that book, it's a, it's a fascinating history uh, of corporate constitutional rights. And what you come to realize when you read that book is that many of the constitutional rights that, that have evolved over time um, have been established by corporations. So it's absolutely the case. Uh, there, there's a, corporations do have constitutional rights. The Hobby Lobby case from a couple of years ago established that, that corporations have free exercise rights yeah. even. So um, a absolutely, um, absolutely, um, Citizens United is not an outlier in, right. in recognizing. That's actually not the part of the opinion that's really that significant. It's become shorthand, but it's, first of all, the bigger case is really Buckley versus Vallejo back in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. But um, the idea that corporations have free speech rights is not a radical idea when, yeah. when held up against American historic, yeah. history. And uh, maybe if I could make one book recommendation, it's a massive tome. It's called The Anti-Oligarchic Constitution. It was just published this year, Fishkin and Forbath. Um, anyway, two law professors, and it's uh, the whole history in terms of understanding uh, economic rights and the Constitution. So I highly recommend it. As I said, it's very, very thick, but worth reading. Um, we do have time for one other question. Do I have, do you want to, I, you were going to, you were going to. I, I, I love it when, uh, underlying is important. Heartening to me coming out of this was um, you stating that what's really important is the consistent application of law. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to favor oligarchs and big corporations over the little guy. But I'm disturbed by something that's below that level, that's even more fundamental, because we all agree that we want to make, protect free speech. Can you put but it clear in your mouth? My, yeah. my, here's my conundrum with this. How do you, as individuals, um, applying your take on things and trying to reach a solution, how do you differentiate between what is disinformation and misinformation and dissenting information and opposing information? And I think that free, protecting free speech protects opposing and dissenting. But, but up here, Anybody, anybody in this room can say, oh, I, that's disinformation or that's in misinformation and say, well, I don't want that out there. Well, right. I think that we tread very close to denying free speech. Yes. And if we're gonna solve anything in this country, we gotta hear every, we gotta hear a whole, right. you know, landscape, wide, wide non-discriminatory landscape of information and opinion and analyses because sometimes when you when you drill down and you look at what someone might think is disinformation or misinformation, you find out that they've got mm -hmm. studies to back this up mm -hmm. and they've got data. Yeah. So you're 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 dealing with dueling data and dueling underlying facts. So I'm just thinking fundamentally it's dangerous to so, shut down free speech at all. And yeah. I like I really am heartened by hearing about consistent application of law. I think that's, that's the, the yeah. personally, from what I've heard tonight, that's the safest way forward. I just, thank you. so it's not a, it's a comment more than a question. Well, no, Roberta, I, I think this is, this is a perfect question to end on because what you're getting at is, is it really disinformation or is it a minority opinion? And so we've been talking a lot about government and government censorship, but I'm going to guess that everybody here has seen examples of social censorship, where certain points of view are considered, we don't even talk about that in this zip code. So I, I, I'm really glad you asked that underlying question, how do we censor one another? So uh, let's just go down the line and start with Justin, and I'd love to hear what you all think. I think those are great points, and I agree with you. Um, from my perspective, uh, I think those are really difficult. Uh, it's really difficult to determine sometimes. Is something misinformation? Did somebody just screw up, make a mistake, and misinform somebody else? Is it disinformation, which I think is usually defined as someone who's intentionally misinforming you, disinforming you? Um, dissenting opinion. Yeah. 
very difficult to find where all of those lines are. So for me, I'm very reluctant to have government step in and make that decision for us and say this is misinformation, this isn't, this is protected, this is not. So I guess as we wrap up here, you know, my final thought would be is that we spent a lot of time talking about regulating social media. And I'm skeptical as to whether or not and how we can, whether or not we can do that under the First Amendment, how we can do that, but, but maybe we can. What I do know, what I feel very strongly about, is that even if we can regulate social media in some way, the solution, that's not the solution by itself. We also need civics education, we need media literacy, we need to teach our youth how to determine whether they're being lied to or whether they're just speaking to somebody who made a good faith mistake, right? We need to teach people how to talk to each other again so we can have conversations and figure out where our differences are, but the reasoning behind them, and to make sure that we're having good faith conversations about these issues that are really important to us and to our country. So um, again, I agree with everything you said. Dangerous ground to have government determine where those lines are for us. Uh, but even if we were to go down that road in some way, we need other solutions. We, we need a combination of, uh, of uh, solutions here to address these underlying problems. To allow for viewpoint diversity, real. both the state and censorship and social media. Right. So we may have opportunity for afterwards to continue this conversation. Just I, I got it. I have a little time keeper here. Um, so yeah, this is an opportunity for final thoughts. But what about this idea of social censorship? Thank you very much. Because uh, really you know question. we've been talking about the law, we've been talking about legality, we've talked about New Hampshire. But in terms of social censorship, um, I would just uh, say. If you look, uh, I'm sp speaking as someone who works in public radio, right? I look at the NHPR Twitter thread, I check it every day. Um, and people who say negative things about the stories we write, and they're horrible. The, 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 you know, they're quickly labeled as offensive and they get deleted by Twitter. Uh, I, uh, I know the news team there extremely well. I know for a fact that if they get something wrong, it's that they said, you know, it was 1983 and not 1981 that something happened. This is not blatant misinformation and yet uh, it is combated every day on Twitter and I guess my point is is that it's easier to do that than let's say people in my community my friends kids I hang out with who are you know in their early 40s like me uh, policing each other and how we refer to everything everything and you must have all experienced this in your daily lives right your friends and family trying to help you figure out the better way the better term to use for this or the better way to think about that and there's fights at kitchen tables all the time, it's a lot easier to just stand away from those fights and be like, you're all stupid, and you're all wrong, and lol, I'm going to drink your tears at the next election. Because that's, it's much easier to do that than to actually have a conversation, crap, I screwed up when I talked to you today, I used the wrong word, and like, I really feel guilty when I do that. I'm just saying, you see in social media one side worrying about how to take each other down, and the other side just standing outside and winning and winning and winning. All right. And, I'm a, and because of the time, we'll have to be a little more succinct. Yes. I'll just echo the importance of civics education, media literacy. Check out Nick's awesome Civics 101 podcast. Yes. Martha yes. Madsen here from New Hampshire Civics is doing amazing work yes. to get it into our schools. Um, but also think about your own ongoing life civic education. I think it's very interesting to note. I've re read a little bit of data about um, the people trying to study how misinformation and disinformation spreads online and what happens. And it's actually, um, as opposed to young students, it's more likely older adults, 40 plus, 60 plus, who are more likely to have trouble discerning different. Maybe because they haven't grown up with social media, so kids just are intuitively picking up on some of these smaller cues. But it's also going to get more and more sophisticated over time. So one thing, one posture I always try to take is that 
I, to, to, to not be overly confident <laughs> in myself and my views and to feel okay saying, I don't know yet, I'm not sure yet, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that, I wanna hear more from you. Um, because as Nick said, it's, it's a lot easier to just feel super confident and, and take other people down, but it, it's, learning is lifelong. Learning, learning is, lifelong. is lifelong, thank you. John. I couldn't agree more with everything that's been said. Um, uh, I, I guess in, in conclusion, what I would point out, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical of these laws. Um, and, 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 and I'm skeptic, even though I'm sympathetic to like the California idea about regulating misinformation. I'm, as a citizen, you know, I, I think it was, it was horrifying to watch the misinformation and the effect it had on the, the pandemic. Um, that said, um, I think that um, I, I, I'm very, very troubled by the idea of government regulating speech. Um, and at the end of the day, I can't help but to see these laws as government regulating speech. And I would remind people, uh, there are other ways to have an impact other than going to the legislature and saying pass a law that regulates speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is the market. Um, I shut my Facebook account down a few months ago. I have not received a call yet from Mark Zuckerberg to see, you know, what can we do to get you back, John? You know, but if enough people do that, you know, um, that's another way to affect the behavior because these are private companies trying to earn a profit. And if the misinformation turns away consumers, they'll stop putting it out, I yes, think. Right, so there's, there's a very practical, get off of social media. Um, and, and one other thing, just because I, I didn't hear you all saying it, go out and look for the best argument on the other side. It's, it's so simple. Don't always reinforce the worst argument with people you disagree with. Go find the best one, and then do some more thinking. Uh, and thank you so much to our panelists for coming out and giving us their very best arguments. Really, excellent work. And thank you to all of you for participating. And, and this was a beautiful moment that we had together. And, and a quick shout out to Tucker and the group here at uh, Feather Friends. Thank you, Feather Friends. And, and if lifelong learning is important, so uh, we hope to be seeing you all at programs coming up in the fall. And uh, wait, it is summer, right? It is summer. Got it. In the fall. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Meg as well for being our host for all of us. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Hope to see you soon.